So you want to know about the Stone Age, huh? The good old times when social media were campfires and when people shared their food. It meant actually physically sharing what they had for nourishment with others so they wouldn't starve to death. And kids wouldn't talk about stupid nonsense because they were too busy learning how to kill giant animals. There was a time when archaeologists thought that the entire Stone Age was mostly free of large-scale violent conflict and that it was only brought about by the Bronze Age. And when looking at Paleolithic times, it makes certain sense. I mean, people at that time didn't seem to have the idea of owning land. There were no city-states or anything like that. And they were mostly nomadic, hunter-gatherers. Although this may very well be a matter of absence of evidence rather than evidence that it didn't occur. But in Neolithic times, there is a lot more. And by that time, people did become sedentary and probably did get the idea of certain patches of dirt belonging to them as opposed to another group. The Neolithic era or Young Stone Age started in different parts of the world at different times, but generally can roughly say it began around 10,000 BCE and then it lasted until around 3,000. Again, roughly, with some regional variation. There are several archaeological sites showing us that the Stone Age was not all sunshine and butterflies as far as interpersonal relationships are concerned, if you will which is not exactly surprising because it's humans and humans are rather violent animals by nature. So one of those sites that I want to talk about is Aspern Schletz in Lower Austria. This belongs to the linear pottery culture dating to 5120 to 4950 BCE. And this was a time period marked by increased violent conflict, or at least we have more evidence of violent conflict from this time. The most well-known is Talheim, which uh, showed 34 individuals who seem to have been massacred and then hastily buried in a mass grave. Uh, this settlement here, Aspan Schletz, has signs of fortification. There is an older inner ditch and a younger outer ditch, as well as evidence of some form of gates. So, as said, rough times, people clearly felt the need to do something to be safe and be able to defend themselves more effectively against attackers. And attackers there were, for sure. There were the remains of 67 skeletons found in the outer ditch. All have signs of fatal injuries caused by blunt and sharp instruments. And these are all perimortem injuries, meaning that these injuries occurred at or near the time of death, which you have to distinguish from damage that happened after the bodies were deposited, shall we say? Most of the information here is from this book, by the way, Stick Stones and Broken Bones, Neolithic Violence in a European Perspective, and specifically the article, The Early Neolithic Site, Aspar and Schletz, Lower Austria, Anthropological Evidence of Interpersonal Violence. And a very good book, by the way. would very much recommend that. It'll be linked down below on Amazon where you can get it. There are a lot of fractures found on the skulls caused by various sharp or blunt implements. And some are very obvious, like this one right here, which is a direct fracture caused by an object hitting in this area. And you also have examples of indirect or bursting fractures away from the point of impact, where the skull is being compressed or otherwise changes shape due to the impact in one area, and then the deformation causes fractures in another area. By the way, when you're looking at these pictures, keep in mind that not all of the damage that you see was necessarily caused by a weapon or tool. It was always the issue of preservation and a lot of the damage happened after the fact, post-mortem. But, you know, if you look at something like this, this hole here with the fractures, so that would be a sign of damage caused by you know, a club, an axe, an adze. And speaking of which, if you look at long, narrow openings in the bone like this, it looks a lot like this was caused by a stone axe or an adze just entering the skull directly. There's another possibility, though. Researchers did some tests with the reproduction of the so-called Thames beater, 
which is this large wooden club here dating to between 3530 and 3340 BCE. So that's around the end of the Neolithic, start of the Bronze Age, fairly close to it. And this is actually shaped more like a paddle, as you can see here. It's not a round club. And they did the kind of practical tests that I personally love to do and am very much looking forward to doing more when I have a suitable location which is they hit things. So they had a skull analog that they struck with this and they came up with a very similar fracture pattern. And if you look at it, this test result here does look quite a bit like the original there. So it's quite possible that this is what was used. And so that would happen if you strike with you know, the top part of the club I could imagine that potentially also happening when striking with the edge at certain angles. This one would require the attacker to be kind of looming over the victim. So maybe the victim is, you know, kneeling or sitting on the ground and just fallen down or was already beaten down and then the attacker was just finishing the job off, so to speak. There are also a few cases of fracture patterns that happen from side to side compression. So in this case, the victim was lying on the ground and was struck on the side of the head. These people were really not taking prisoners. I mean, they might have been, more about that later, but that's, that's pretty brutal to just keep beating somebody on the ground. Also, in general, there were a lot of impacts, you can tell by the remains. Also, in Talheim, same kind of deal, where you generally don't have just one hit, you have repeated hits on the skull over and over again. So they were just going all out, basically. Uh, there's also one unique type of breakage, which is a ring fracture, and this is caused by hitting the top of the head hard enough that the spinal column is pushed against the base of the skull. Brutal. Another pattern comes from a blunt object striking horizontally to the lower face. In other words, baseball swing to the teeth. They found that the right side of the head was injured about as often as the left, and the researchers took this as a hint that people were attacked from the front and behind, about equally, assuming right-handed attackers, and I'm always pretty skeptical about that. I mean, even setting handedness aside, if we really assume that the majority of people are generally naturally right-handed, there is nothing really preventing you from striking backhanded, you know, especially if you turn around to face somebody who stands to the right of you, you're much more likely to actually strike from your left side. And so then you would hit them on their right side if you're, they're facing you or on their left side if they're facing away from you. So this could be scrambled. I wouldn't necessarily draw conclusions from that. However, I would say that in certain situations, it does seem pretty likely. Talheim, for example, where the majority of injuries happened to the back and the right side of the skull. So it does seem likely that a lot of strikes were done from the right side, right-handed, and from behind, um, either while well, chasing somebody or perhaps after having dealt with everybody who's capable of fighting in that village and then just lining up the rest and just popping them in the head. Who knows? Hard to say. Nobody was spared among the 67 victims. We have 12 infants at the age of 0 to 6, 8 children the age of 6 to 18, and 18 individuals aged 40 to 60, which would be fairly old at the time. And overall, we have a pretty typical age distribution for a settlement, except young women are underrepresented. Only one or two females aged 13 to 20 were found, five female adults aged 20 to 40. So it's been suggested that the younger women were mostly abducted. They seem demographically mostly absent. Also, the number of newborns supports the abduction hypothesis. There's just you know, too many children and not enough women of suitable age, really, to make that plausible. So, yeah, the attackers could have taken them with them. Some parts of the arms and legs were removed or pulled apart as gnaw marks from animals. So the bones were clearly unburied and exposed for a while, up to half a year, in fact. So another group probably eventually 
passed by and found them and buried them. Can you imagine, you know, living in the Stone Age and, you know, you, you travel from one place to the other? Maybe it was even a neighboring village and you come by this village and it's just the stench and it's just rotten corpses in the trench and you just see all these people were just exterminated. Well, war is gruesome and inhumane. What else is new? Can you call this war? That's the other question. And it's a good question. You know, how large does a conflict have to be to count as war? You know, do they have to be socio-political factors involved? But we don't know any of that. Of course, we just see the aftermath and what happened, why these people did what they did. Who knows? We can only speculate. Uh, the evidence suggests that the settlement was no longer in use afterwards. So this is not a conquest. Talheim looks a lot like that because the settlement was actually con in continued use afterwards. That could have been because survivors returned, but it could also have been because the attackers just took over. So hard to say. In this case, they were just left as is. From what I've read, no burned layer was found, so there's no evidence that they actually burned the structure to the ground. So it looks like whoever did it just attacked, killed off most or all of the villagers, except possibly some women which they dragged off, and then they left. So, alternative interpretation I've read is that it might have been an internal conflict. So, think basically the Neolithic equivalent of a civil war, perhaps? Maybe there was like some kind of internal struggle seems unlikely to me because of the end of the settlement, you know, if one group or one part of the, the population there turned on the other, seems like they would, would have continued to stay in that settlement and just buried the casualties. But who knows, they, they may have also had beliefs about the place being contaminated or being haunted by the dead or who knows what. There's so many things you can speculate we don't know for sure. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. If you're looking for more books about history, check out the link down below. I've got a list of things I recommend on Amazon. There's also a link to my Patreon page and subscribe star. So there's various ways to support the channel and make sure it doesn't go the way of Neolithic settlements, I suppose. And um, yeah, that's about it. Have a good one, folks.